So today we are here uh, with Preparation Tech with David Hansen. David Hansen is one of the world's leading experts in terms of social robots. And because I probably cannot describe it as good as you can, David, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Please tell us who you are, what you do, and why your work matters. Great, thank you so much, Deborah, and hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to participate in this conversation today. Uh, social robots are about connections with people. It's about human-centered AI and machines that can help people make the world better. So particularly social robots um, brings a kind of presence or social presence to robots that um, usually uses our innate desire for interpersonal connection and the way that the brain is wired to recognize um, other living beings and then uses robots as a kind of synthetic living being to represent that presence. So it can mean that it looks like, um, you know, robots uh, that are, you know, maybe from movies or cartoons, those often have a kind of human-like form and something that's expressive about them, um, you know, like the robots from Star Wars. Um, so, you know, anytime there's a social presence, that's basically a social robot. But um, in my case, I'm making them look very, very human-like, you know, in the same way that computer animation technologies, computer-generated imagery is used to make all kinds of characters seem to come to life. And that can be useful for um, not just for video games and for movies, but also for learning, for uh, for you know simulation, for healthcare, for therapy, for all kinds of things. Well, um, by making that into robots, by making robots look like all kinds of characters with realistic faces, sometimes cartoon-like faces with physical bodies that can walk and move and dance and laugh and, and socially interact with us, then we can make the technology meaningful to people. And then that means that there's an emotional connection that can happen and, um, and it becomes a new kind of art form, but it also becomes more communicative. It means that the machines can interact with you. So I've developed um, you know, that, I mean, all, many decades of robots with many different appearances, and it's taken a whole lot of different skills and different disciplines to be able to make these kinds of robots. One of the robots that you might know about is Sophia, yeah. but there are others, like um, there's one called Bina48, which was a great collaboration with the Terrorism Movement, and one called Diego-san, and another one that's a portrait of Albert Einstein. And so there are many different robots. They're all sculpted sculpted, animated, they're engineered, they have material science and um, AI algorithms that allow them to understand speech and have a conversation. So I've had to learn quite a bit about these, but also how to, how to collaborate with people from different disciplines. And that is, um, in a sense, it's like what social robotics is about. It's not just about the robot socializing with people, but it's about people socializing with people better. Mm -hmm. And why would you develop social robots? I mean, uh, you mentioned that you can use them for health and for education and stuff, but um, what, why would companies want to commercialize this kind of stuff? Well, the, uh, the, these kinds of robots can be genuinely useful. Now, um, you know, uh, often technology startups think um, and investors and big tech companies, they'll think of technology as something that has a specific kind of non-human like utility. You know, it's like, does it harvest plants better or does it, you know, uh, you know, build your car better? These would be things that you would think of as like real robot utilities. You know, does it crunch on your data better? This kind of thing. But um, that's ignoring the human emotional reality. We are social creatures. And we're not just intelligent in an abstract way. We're intelligent, um, as biologists say, as you social, you socially intelligent creatures. This means like, you know, when you have creatures that interact with each other in a, in a larger group and they, their intelligence enhances each other. Bees are eusocial creatures and together they're quite smart actually. Mm -hmm. um, and humans are smarter together than they are apart. We're not just individuals. 
we're a whole community. And um, so making technologies that enhance that community and enhance that social connection and practice those circuits, train those circuits in the brain so that we're not just all in a restaurant staring at a slab <laughs> around the table. Instead, it's training us back towards the social connection. Um, so, uh, and that can have real market utility. It can be useful in the business place. I mean, you can see, you know, well, you know, some simulation of, of the human social presence has made a lot of money, computer graphics, um, as computer graphics. Video games with uh, animated characters are worth billions of dollars every year. And um, the um, computer generated movies also generate a lot of money. Um, and uh, the kind of social training and medical training that also has um, this sort of social presence is also um, worth a lot of money um, for medical simulation technologies. It's over a $1.4 billion marketplace. And um, then, um, uh, you know, the, for the robot, uh, you can sort of see that there's a little bit of a legacy. So animatronics for theme parks bring visitors, millions of visitors every year for um, you know rides at Disney, the Hall of Presidents, and and uh, you know Pirates of the Caribbean, or anim animatronic figures, the Navi, um, the you know Avatar Navi um, robots are really great masterworks in robotics. Um, they don't actually socially interact with you, but as you're going through the rides, it feels like they are. Um, so uh, then toys, robotic toys, are sometimes social robots, but they're very simple. Um, but um, you know, that's kind of interesting. What I'm looking to do is bridge the world of um, cognitive AI and robotics. So we've made robots like Sophia as a platform with an API and SDK. We've had a bunch of collaborators and most of the robots that I've made have gone into these academic research environments with platform-based tools. Now it's taken a while for Sophia, so she's mostly just appeared in the news media and we've published our own science papers or whatnot, but we've only now finally finished the mass manufacturing. None of the, I mean, dozens and dozens of robots that I've designed before. Um, they were useful and they were in the centers for disease control, for respirator um, oh, testing, um, and uh, they were used in autism therapy. And, you know, there's um, a spinoff company uh, from Hanson Robotics called Robokind, which has deployed hundreds of robots for, um, for treating autism. And there's, um, uh, the, there are many other robots out there in science museums that we've developed and, and uh, uh, cognitive AI research. But uh, they were all, uh, like the ones that I made previously, they were handmade. So there were works of technology, but also, you know, handmade works of art. So Sophia as a platform now brings the best that we could get from all the different branches of robots and puts it all into one platform and um, gets the cost down. So now she has hands that can grasp and manipulate and she can pick up like a little um, uh, like bottle cap or, uh, or a nut and uh, move it from one place to the other. She can pick up a pencil and she can draw and paint. Um, we've done demonstrations where she can pick up cards and play cards. Um, uh, then we put you know all kinds of sensors and perceptual modules in there so she can sense people she can now move through a space she can self navigate through she's she's like wandering through our lab now self navigating through the lab she can find her way back to her charger station all by herself and we also put together tools for developing um, uh, useful applications and also for developing the art because right now Sophia and our robots, they're not conscious, they're not fully conscious like people are. Um, so how we develop um, the sense of social presence is through what's called interactive fiction. And that's where you take you know, the best technologies and you, and you apply the best writing, artistry, animation, procedural animation, and you create the illusion of life. Now, this is interesting because we have the illusion of life, but we've also got the tools for researching what we think of as artificial life, like the pursuit of real life and consciousness over time, maybe machines within our, Whoa. I don't know, maybe in our life. We're talking about Terminator, David. This is like bringing these machines to life. Well, yeah, but um, the thing is that we're looking to develop them by social robots to make them so that they build a good relationship with people so they co-evolve with us and if they become conscious it's like a child coming into the world raised in a loving family 
And that's what we want uh, for these kinds of machines. And whether we don't know if it's possible in our lifetime or not, but certainly acting on the possibility of it makes us rise to the occasion. Because if they ever do become conscious, we want to respect that. And at the same time, by practicing caring behaviors, we become more caring to people. People show, psychologists show that empathy training and this kind of empathy practice with, um, even with dolls, can result in better human-human connections. And so um, the interactive fiction can be purposeful in this way, um, not just in the pursuit of a crazy dream like conscious caring machine, but just in the human human connections that we need to foster and appreciate today. I have a question for you. You're talking about this. You're super enthusiastic about this. What's your story? How did you get from being a little kid, like a 10 year old to being one of the world's leading social robot experts? Like what were you interested in when you were little? What kind of schooling did you have? Well, um, when I, when I was a little, I was really interested in fossils and dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to be a paleontologist when I grew up, but I also wanted to be an inventor and I wanted to be an artist and I really liked physics and um, uh, the cosmos. I liked um, uh, stories, you know, I liked um, science fiction. And so I was quite a dreamer. And, you know, I had a family that you know, fortunately for me, really encouraged that and gave me some role models. You know, my um, uh, my my mom was a was a real dreamer. My grandma, her mom was a what um was a professor. Um, was uh, uh and um, taught English literature. My uncle, my mom's um brother, was a senior scientist that I or senior uh, engineer at IBM, uh, who was their systems engineer of the year. And, you know, he showed me cellular automata. And like, um, we had these very nerdy conversations. So I mean, I was really fortunate to be around people who, who inspired me to, to dream. And I had some professors because I was, you know, being a, kind of a daydreamer. Um, if the class didn't hold my attention, I would I would kind of like wander off and some, you know, so, you know, like doing disciplined school activities was um, either like I was all in or I was checked out. And um, so, uh, but fortunately I was able to find, um, you know, some mentors and professors who really nurtured this. And um, so I was interested in the arts and I was interested in engineering and I wound up going to this um, arts high, high school. Um, called Arts Magnet, Booker T. Washington School of High School for the Performing and Visual Arts in Dallas, Texas. Wow! Um, wow! Yeah, I was so lucky, and um, so I made lifelong friends there. Um, some of my best friends in, uh, in the whole world are, are uh, some fellow students from from Arts Magnet High School, and so um, and then. I was pretty lucky because they put me in some accelerated math and science classes as well. Um, uh, I was a, a bit, um, you know, I mean, I was like thinking about all these things, like how these things, what is the meaning of art? How does art work? Like, why is it subjective? So subjective, you know, how do you make it make sense? I, um, you know, and then at the same time, I was thinking about, you know, things like exponential functions and, you know, what if you created a self-reinventing superintelligence? It would be like an exponential function. It should gen like, you know, it invents itself to be smarter. And then once it's smarter, it can invent itself to be smarter still. And, um, you know, so, and if, if it was made in the right way, then that could help solve the hard problems of the planet. You know, at the time, global warming was just in the news and, um, and, you know, there was, I was worried that, Humanity might not survive. I felt like we needed to solve these these problems. We needed to pull together, and that um, you know, like solving those technologies might help. So I kept vacillating back and forth between okay, science is the answer. No, but I I'm so distracted by the arts. I'm just figure drawing all the time, and I I was playing in the um, I you know started playing guitar and got into founded a couple of bands and got in the high school jazz band and then was like writing screenplays and making short films and um and then i went to college to, to start studying science but then i transferred to art school um 
at Rhode Island School of Design yeah. and studied film, animation, video. And then I took classes at Brown University, which is a sister school to Rhode Island School of Design. So um, there I joined the Robotics Club. I um, joined the Student Council and I was doing like um, this art uh, tech festival called Pong and an art, um, art technology club that we named Interalia. We founded this, this art tech club. And um, so, um, so I was like uh, across the street taking these holography classes and computer science classes, programming, like learning a little bit about AI. Um, and uh, I built, uh, like, um, so I got to like nourish my inner nerd um, by, um, by playing on that. But at the same time, I was really dreaming about how these technologies could transform the world. And I'm, because I was a film animation video student, I was thinking about the nature of human social dynamics. How does that work? How can we um, gamify that and turn it into a kind of interactive narrative experience? How can we take characters and use that, the character animation as an interface for AI and robotics. How can we put these things together? And I built my first robots um, there. So that was 1993 and 94. And, um, and I, I was uh, on the side, um, I was hired because I had uh, some pretty good figure drawing skills. So I was offered a job doing some sculptures. And I found that I could sculpt pretty well um, uh, without studying that really. So I got a job as a sculptor out of school and I went to work for Disney Imagineering. Um, uh, doing sculpture. And um, so, you know, uh, at the same time, I was like, I was like, you know, I really need to be focusing on robots and AI, because that's what's going to save the world. You know, that old high school dream that I mentioned, where like this idea that, you know, self and reinventing machines. And I was like, well, at least, you know, narrative, like I can tell these screenplays and stories and create this art that sort of pushes the boundary on that. But I was also aware that Disney had these animatronic figures. And at the time they had just hired these um, AI scientists and robot scientists in the late nineties. Um, so Marvin Minsky and Danny Hills who are, were like really big names in AI um, were Disney fellows at the time. And this one giant robot uh, that Danny Hills was developing this walking dinosaur was in the same building where I was doing these, um, you know, uh, works that I was doing. I was I was doing sculpture and robotics as I transitioned, and then I moved into this um, robotics job. So I got to be exposed to like the you know these walking um, machines, and I built um, also like a little walking robot and facial expression expressive robot, and started researching after they moved me into that technical development job. So those um, like engineering classes in undergrad they paid off. I had um, also pushed myself, I guess, um, you know, and I was on these engineering teams. I won the um, uh, uh, the grand prize world championship for Odyssey of the Mind, a creative problem solving competition with with the. Uh, and my team did such a good job. I was really proud. And there was like this little robot, uh, like a robotic vehicle that would carry a team member around this obstacle course and there was some art stuff. And then this other NASA prize thing that I was involved in that came out of the ho those hologram classes. I got uh, the really weird and random opportunity to collaborate with Mary Lou Jepsen who uh, went on to do one laptop per child and she's such a super genius and she's like doing this uh, new um, holographic brain scanning technology called open water so you should totally check that out she would be a great person for your show oh okay God. well hook me up david hook me up <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah so uh, it was like um it seemed like a, a, a long a winding random road but all these skills added up um because like you know, part of what I did at Disney was investigate next generation skin materials for their animatronics and artificial muscle actuators. So I connected with the material science community and material physicists. I was so lucky. They flew me to like these labs at Berkeley and Stanford and, um, and uh, like uh, jet propulsion lab. I was able to walk in and like talk with these scientists, you know, and here I was just like this crazy artist, you know, <laughs> um, hacker kind of guy. Um, and so, um, but uh, they responded. They were, you know, some of these people I collaborated with and co-authored some books with a senior scientist at the Jet Propulsion Lab later. So I brought all these skills. I left Disney in 2001 and I applied for graduate school and so I started work um, 
on a degree in interactive arts and engineering at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, and, you know, it was really a game focused program, but um, fortunately, the, you know, the deans of the two schools, computer science and arts and humanity, were very responsive to my passion on this. And they let me define my own curriculum to make these human-like robots as works of art, philosophical investigations. I took a bunch of cognitive science and neuroscience classes and set up psychology studies. And I you know, was playing with materials and material science, trying to develop these facial expression techniques and technologies and you know, sculpting, hand sculpting the faces and animating. You know, it's just like robot after robot, year after year. And um, so I was very lucky to um, get um, so much um, support. And, you know, just in the same way that I mentioned that I was an oddball student in high school and some sometimes the teachers would support me and other times they wouldn't. Uh, the same thing was true, you know, in graduate school too. You know, was, I just found some people who were so generous and mentored me and collaborated with me. And, um, you know, that that really laid the foundation for for everything and um if it weren't for the community and the people involved i wouldn't have been able to accomplish anything that um that i did or very little of what i did and um my hope is that everything that i've developed has served as useful tools for that community as well so mm -hmm. it all awesome. comes full cycle awesome so in your opinion what characteristics and mindset are, would somebody who would be successful in the robotics industry have? So what, so if there are guidance counselors, teachers and parents out there with kids who may be interested in this field or not, what are the characteristics and mindset that they should be looking for? Well, I mean, there's so many different ways. So there, you know, it's like if a particular person is a very sort of careful and meticulous person and very focused on certain interests that you, you know, and you are just imagine you could go into computer science, you could go into math, you could go into um, uh, physics or um, mechanical engineering. You know, you could really focus on these areas. Um, you know, uh, on the other hand, often some of the kids who might be, um, you know, more like um, wandering in the way that they think, which was kind of my way, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, more like creative and artistic in temperament, uh, um, could still make major contributions to the field. So I would say um, among the people, no matter what their dispositions are, I mean, I've worked with so many different people, so many different cognitive um, and neural states you know uh, neurotypical and not neurotypical um you know and i would fall somewhere in 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 there <laughs> you know so um but the, the the thing that really works above all else is a playful state of mind make it fun you know um just because you, there might be some things that have been discovered before that you have to learn along the way. And it can be fun to master those skills. It can also be fun to be creative, to think what, what next, mm -hmm. you know, um, why ask these deep questions and maybe there aren't answers. You know, if you keep asking why about things long enough, you, you come to the end of the sidewalk, you know, and, and then there's like mystery. And how fun is that, right? The mystery of the unknown, of what's to be discovered next. Mm -hmm. And that creative and playful spirit is, is, is so important, you know, because, you know, otherwise it's, it's easy to be afraid of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as soon as you realize that it's an opportunity to, to play, to discover, then you get brave about the unknown. And and it and it's infectious too, you know. Then people want people want to come along and play too, and um and I think uh, that for me that's the single most important factor, and that's a gift that my family gave me, and my friends, mm -hmm. and all the people who have a playful spirit who resonate with 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 me in this way. Great. Final question. 
what advice would you give to kids who are passionate about robotics? We teach a lot of robotics courses and once kids start, they just like, wow, we want to just keep building and building. So what kind of advice, what can they do to just to, to create a, like a path to getting to not quite maybe where you are, but really having a rewarding career in robotics? Um, well, I would say um, write down the skills that you think are needed. Ask the people like, you know, so you create these lists and then choose your exercises um, for that and and try to work ahead or outside whatever the curriculum is. You know, I mean, this is what I saw on some of these creative problem solving competitions like and, and, and this is how I, how I handled my graduate school. It's like, you know, the curriculum, first of all like what I wanted to do didn't neatly fit in a curriculum. So I found a curriculum that I could mildly adapt to me. And then I would fit whatever my interests were to, to that, you know, but then I had to work ahead, you know, work beyond what my skills were beyond what was reasonable. So I would just say, um, you know, um, that, uh, 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 don't forget, um, to follow your dream where it leads and, um, and then figure out, like as your mind works ahead towards what that dream is, then you can write down all those skills like a path, like paving stones in a sidewalk. And once you've mastered those skills, then you're able to run ahead. I mean, honestly, um, I haven't mastered all the skills that I wanted to and that I want to, you know, it's like, I'm not a master programmer. I can barely tinkering program. You know, I, I've done a little bit of Python. I've, um, I, I took these C++ courses, but I'm not a good coder. And often the programmers are like, okay, get out of the way and leave it to us. But at least I learned enough that I can speak the language. And, um, uh, you know, and it's that way. And sometimes in each one of these disciplines that I, that I tinker in, um, I may have some insight, you know, because if you're leaping between fields in this way, then um, you might get um, insights across the board. So when it comes to robotics, it's inherently interdisciplinary. And you can ask these questions, well, why? Why do you put these disciplines together in this way? And with robotics, usually it's, well, because I want to achieve this thing here or that you know, thing there. But what defines robots? I mean, it's sensors plus processors plus a motorized output. So you have some kind of perceptual or sensing input. And then you know this like actioned, this uh, like the decision process and, and, and some kind of mechanical action on the output. But what kind of definition of is that really, right? It just, you know, because um, a household printer could satisfy that or, you know, you know, a smart blender could satisfy that. You've got sensors and a little microcontroller, you know, I mean, but is it a robot? Well, probably not. I mean, I think that intuitively we think of a robot as being a, an, a synthetic or artificial living being. And that's why, like, when it starts to move kind of like a living being, even factory robots, you know, it's like, whoa, those look like big, like, crab arms or something, you know, that are making the cars. And, you know, so intuitively, it's like this th thing. And that's how, I mean, robot, the word robot and the word robotics both came from science fiction writers. Carl Chapek invented the word robot. And and Isaac Asimov, a science fiction writer, invented the word ro robotics. The entire field was born of imagination. And in both cases, they were where machines seemed to come to life um, or really came to life in the context of the story. They, they, you know, it was like these living machines. And so I think that we should go back to the roots and encourage imagination and say, well, what defines a life form? And can machines be alive? So while the engineering discipline sometimes, you know, we're like trying to solve these practical challenges, don't forget to dream, dream ahead, push yourself past the boundaries of what is known. And there will be people who may discourage that and be like, no, robots are not synthetic life forms. That's not valid. You will find grumps out there who will <laughs> tell you not to, but, but you got to just keep dreaming. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. This has been an amazing interview. And I'm just, I didn't know that you're really coming from the arts fields and coming into robots <laughs> and, and you blend all of these different um, fields and studies. And it's just amazing that you are a renaissance, renaissance man, right? And this is where a lot of careers in tech are going. So this is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your questions and your show. Uh, and I wish all of you, uh, uh, you know, the best with all your dreams and hopes. And please stay in touch. Great.